substantiate the, uh, the Google's experiment that uh, in their setting, in the benign noise setting, it is actually a, a good benchmark uh, in terms of tracking the fidelity. So uh, I think the cross entropy, uh, if, if it's a very important, it's a useful statistics to know about, uh, it's, a, it's a useful statistic to know about uh, experiments in a non-adversarial noisy setting. And, uh, and I think it's, it's useful to know. Uh, I think uh, as setting it as a, you know, uh, as, as a benchmark for adversarial, basically as a challenge for classical algorithms, that's, that's problematic because classical algorithms can cheat. Uh, and uh, so, so, uh, so in that sense, uh, I, think it's, so it's a good, I think it's a good benign uh, benchmark. I'm not sure it's a good adversarial uh, benchmark. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Boris. So let's maybe um, move on to the panel. Um, so let me just do a quick introduction. So we have a we have a really uh, um, very um, you know very good panel for this this particular topic. Um, um, so um, uh, Bill Bill Pfefferman, um, who um, um, who was a was a postdoc at Berkeley, and now he's on the faculty at. Uh, at Chicago, he's been studying, you know, this these questions of uh, the the uh, random quantum circuits and and advantage in that, but from a computational complexity viewpoint, uh, for a very long time. Uh, Sun Won Choi, who is on who is uh, a co-author on this paper, he he also coincidentally was a Miller postdoc at Berkeley, and he's now on the faculty at MIT, and he's uh, he studied these questions again, also quite extensively from. Uh, from a physics theory viewpoint, but also you know statistical mechanics viewpoint. So, so I think we can get uh, very different viewpoints. And and Sergio Barkso, uh, uh, you all know from previous panel appearances. So Sergio is at Google, and he's he's really I, I think he studied again these these questions both from the viewpoint of um, the experimental effort at Google, but also from from a theoretical viewpoint. So so I think we are going to you know the. Uh, we'll we'll get uh, really quite a quite a deep and broad uh, view into into some of these results. So uh, maybe what what, I, what I'd like to do is uh, you know have the panelists you know take turns at um, giving their uh, uh, their viewpoint and reactions and summary of how how they view view these results. Uh, let me let me just um, just say that there's there was something that uh, Bo, as you said very briefly, but may, I don't know if it came came across so clearly. So um, I, I think one of the one of the reasons we found in in the in the you know from a from a computational viewpoint, uh, you know, random circuit sampling, um, uh, you know, these these results on on supremacy advantage quite. Compelling or you know plausible was uh, was this um, Aronson Chen and Aronson Gunn uh, conjectures, which which sort of are of an asymptotic nature, right? That they say, look, um, if if you were to uh, you know that that there's this there's this um, when you when you are sampling the output of a of a random quantum circuit, then um, um, then the output uh, the, the strings that are output tend to be heavy. They tend to be uh, heavier than average in terms of the, their probabilities. And then they have this specific conjecture saying that if you were to try to recreate those, you know, try to generate heavy outputs, or you know, there, there are various statistical ways to to say this, but that that you if you know you needed exponential if you were trying to recreate this. Uh, samples with this kind of characteristic, you needed exponential amount of computing power uh, as a function of the of the total um, um, uh, size of the circuit, and um, and so what you're what you're basically showing is asymptotically that that uh, that statement is not true, and so so maybe you know just just highlighting that aspect of what, what you showed, and then maybe we can go around and and see how. Uh, um, I, I just wanted to bring that up, and then I, I'd really love to hear what the panelists have to say generally about about the talk and uh, and about all the points that you brought up. 
So in any order that you you would like. So would would one of you like to step in first? And so I already talked for now. So maybe someone else can talk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So I'm I'm happy to I'm happy to start. Maybe address some of the things that Umesh was saying because I have a similar feeling. Um, so so okay. So uh, so first, thanks to Buzz for giving a very nice talk. Um, it's very clear. Uh, so so I guess when I think about these these sort of spoofing results for linear cross entropy, I, I feel like there's sort of two different perspectives, and they're related, but I think uh, still sort of orthogonal in in a, in a way. Uh, and and that's the first is sort of a practical perspective where you can ask, you know, uh, for a fixed system size, a fixed circuit depth, you know, a fixed fidelity, you know, does your classical algorithm uh, score better than the uh, the noisy experiment, right? And and it seems to me like uh, the answer for the current Google experiment is is, is probably no. Like they, they seem to have outperformed your, your algorithm. But then, you know, somehow if, if you play this game where you increase the system size and you don't sort of proportionally decrease the uh, the gate fidelity, then then it seems like eventually your your algorithm will will win out, right? Uh, but and, and and so these are of course interesting messages and they help us with these non-theoretical questions. But I, I think what I'd like to talk about, which is I think more related to what Umesh was saying, is you know, what are the theoretical reasons we have for believing that, uh, you know, that scoring on a benchmark like linear cross entropy is hard in the first place, right? And I think the, uh, the, the main reason we had, as far as I could tell, theoretically, um, which is again, asymptotically, so it's not, not so practical, but still I think very important, was this conjecture by, uh, by Aronson and Gunn, which said that, you know, uh, linear cross entropy uh, is, is hard, you know, sufficiently, is, is hard to score, you know, at a sufficiently high level, assuming a conjecture called uh, x squared is true, right? And X-Quath, I mean, we can, we can formalize it, but roughly speaking, uh, you know, for, for the purpose of this panel, what it's saying is that it should be hard to, uh, to estimate uh, you know, a fixed output probability of a random circuit uh, with a bias that's slightly better, uh, like inverse exponential in N, better than the trivial algorithm that just outputs one over two to the N. Right, and so if I, I maybe I'd like to start by uh, by just trying to to understand what exactly you've shown. It seems like you fall at least for some natural family of circuits. You know, I, I if I understood your your uh, your slides, you said this quickly, but it seemed like when the depth was sublinear, uh, you know, in 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 the system size n, you you've actually falsified this x quath conjecture. Um, so you know, assuming that's the case, then what I think what it's what it's saying is that. Uh, you know, it might be hard to score, say, one over poly in linear cross entropy, but we no longer have the sort of theoretical justification we thought we had. Uh, namely, you know, uh, before the, the sort of really formal evidence that we had was, was this connection between, you know, uh, linear scoring well and linear cross entropy, let's say one over poly. I understand, of course, the noisy algorithm does not score one over poly. It scores something like two to the minus D, but let's just say we're, we're scoring really well. I think it's still, even if you know scoring one over poly, the only evidence we really had was this Aronson and Gunn uh, conjecture, that, this x quath conjecture, and it seems like you're, you're, you've falsified it. So you know, it, we don't really have uh, sort of a good theoretical underpinning for this conjecture. Um, but but that's, that's my interpretation. I'd love to hear more about, uh, about what you have to say. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think maybe, maybe uh, I don't know if I should answer or should we should maybe continue. Uh, but but generally, I think yeah, the, the, the what we show is that for some natural uh, uh, families of algorithms, the it's really about exponential in the depth as opposed to exponential in the in the size. And um, yeah. And, and when you think but, of but can the, I just wait, sorry? Can I just confirm? Because there's two problems we're talking about, right? One is the uh, the linear cross entropy problem, uh, right? Which is about you know outputting samples essentially that are sufficiently heavy with respect to the output distribution of the circuit. And and I think uh, if I understood your 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 talk, what you were saying is that your score on that uh, on that particular problem uh, was something like inverse exponential in in D. Mm -hmm. Is that right? And maybe there's like some const there's some constant in the exponent that, that we didn't yes, say, yes. but it's something like two to the minus constant times D. But yes. then there's a separate, okay, so then that doesn't, for example, contradict the hardness of scoring one over poly in linear cross right. entropy. Uh, but then there's a separate question, which is this Aronson and Gunn conjecture, this x quath uh, conjecture, which is, you know, um, how hard is it to estimate um, the output probability of, you know, the fixed output probability, like the, the probability we see the all zeros outcome when we measure, uh, you know, to, with, to a bias that's inverse exponential in N better than, uh, you know, the, the, the trivial algorithm, which always outputs two to the minus N. 
And if I if I understood correctly, there you were actually able to uh, to falsify that conjecture for sublinear depth circuits. Is that is that a correct understanding? Yes. Uh, uh, now now I have to uh, be, remember the the uh, numbers precisely. Maybe one of my co-authors knows. Uh, can maybe maybe I can say a few words. Yes. So, like, in, yeah, technically speaking, for the like a. Uh, you know, our result is that for the depth that's sublinear, we can actually get the B-string distributions right. that's correlated with the ideal output. And then in some sense, this result is not terribly surprising from point of view of say physics, okay? To, to do that, let's consider like uh, not the qubit, but the spins. You start from all spins like polarized down and zero. And then let's make a mean field approximation. I'm going to study how these spins will evolve under this random unitary circuit. But I'm not going to simulate a full quantum dynamics, but for example, I'm only interested in say one particular spin in the middle is more likely to be up or more likely to be down. And one, best, one way to do that is, okay, you know, we, we forget about simulating entire you know, circuits, but calculate the expectation value, say, as Z operator of that particular spin at the output spin, out the output, you know, of the channel. And then just try to estimate by best by starting from mean field approximations and then adding the perturbations gradually. I'm just talking about the, the Feynman's path integral formulating the, you know, in the operator basis, right? And what it means is that you know, if the depth is not as large, like to not, to, I mean, if, if depth is sufficiently, you know, you know, short uh, compared to the system size, actually this polarization information can be estimated by in, including all the path, like a usually simple path, not involving entire many body, you know, the interference, which is reasonable if depth is not crazy deep. So in this regime, we can estimate these correlated B-strings by just figuring out the polarization of the output. So, so, okay, so there was this conventional wisdom, I think, when it came to uh, x quoth that I think was advocated by a number of papers, which was that sort of the best thing you can do to estimate the fixed, you know, the output probability of a fixed uh, outcome of a random circuit is to is to essentially take a, a, a Feynman path integral, which had, you know, in the standard basis, which had like two to the nd terms or something like, you know, exponential in, in the size terms and sort of subsample. And I think the idea was somehow that, you know, because it was a random circuit, all of the paths should have about equal weight and, and, and so on. And you know, because that was the best you can do, uh, this sort of motivated the quoth conjecture. And it seems like that you're, you're, you're sort of saying explicitly that this is, not, this is not the case. For some interesting regime of parameters, uh, you, know, you can do better than, than, than that. Is, that. is that right? Yeah, but let me make a modification in two aspects. Okay. First of all, the, you know, if you write down XCB, that's actually closely related to the formulation of quoth. However, there we are not talking about the single, uh, single B strings, but the, actually the average over all these strings or the sum over right. all these strings, right? So here the problem is a little more relaxed because we are not, you know, we are not given a particular string to an estimate the probability of that strings, but we are okay to get whatever the correlated these strings distributions are. So that we do, you know, relaxes the uh, you know problem a little bit. Uh, and actually, what was the second part? Um, um, so I, mean, I, th I think maybe thing. maybe even like for new uh, for uh, say suppose you you have like a really really shallow circuit like a constant depth circuit, then uh, and suppose these were like how random gates, then even the marginals are probably not going to be perfectly uh, half half right. Uh, so so just look at the say uh, just look at the first uh, five. Uh, at the first five outputs of the, ignore everything else. And just based on this marginal, you could get some estimate. Uh, uh, you, you might be able to get some estimate of the probability of that string, which would be non-trivial. Non so, so I mean, maybe that would give all of the intuition why you don't necessarily have to, you, you, you can have shortcuts if you're just trying to get something that is correlated, right? You, you, don't, need, you, you don't need to know exactly the, the probability distribution, but you want to get some estimate that is correlated with the distribution that say when it's up, it's more likely to be up and then it's down, it's more likely to be down. And when you don't know, you just say, I don't know. Yeah, actually, let me add to that point because like uh, this, is, this is something that I found very interesting. Um, so naively we say all paths will have this you know, same probability. 
which is not true if you assume unitary circuit from the hard random. Because hard random doesn't always maximize uh, you know, the weight uh, or like maximally mixes the weight, but sometimes you will be able to Z rotations. So on average, actually, there's a certain correlation we can learn from it. So initially we were leveraging those approaches. And then actually, like thanks to Sergio, actually we learned from uh, Sergio, actually the Google circuit actually is more with a better design. It's almost near optimum design. So the actually circuit makes sure that all the B-string paths uh, have the equal amplitude. So that's actually extremely difficult situation to simulate. And then we realized maybe we don't do the path integral in the in original state basis, but in the poly operator basis. And there, the small weight operators has a higher uh, you know, amplitude in the path integral. Therefore, the simulation is not entirely exponentially you know, distributed. Sorry, can I, can I just ask a very quick question? And then I, I'd love for Sergio to uh, chime in as well, because you haven't had a chance. But uh, just to follow up very quickly, Sunwon, um, to what you were saying about depth, so um, shallow circuits. So what if, you, what if you were to restrict attention to circuits where, where you have n qubits and depth n? You know, so where, where, the, where the depth is roughly the same as the number of qubits, then does your result actually say something uh, non-trivial there with respect to Aronson gun? Or is that where it sort of stops saying something? Uh, it's tricky. First of all, like our scaling behavior that only depends on the depth will still be the true. However, now, now the game is, okay, we have a, you know, decaying, our, our the correlation will decay as a function of depth, but now depth itself is a system size. Therefore, the amount of correlation will be exponentially small and then it's order like dimension of the Hilbert space. So, right, so, so here, um, when the depth is equal to the number of qubits, yeah. So are you thinking of the system size as number of qubits or the number of gates? So the number of gates would now be- the Oh, sorry. Depth. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I was meant to say the number of qubits. If the, if the depth is equal to the number of qubits, uh, our performance or the correlation decays as a function of depth, but that's already you know, exponential in the number of qubits. And you can match it with the, match it with the dimension. So now it, it's questionable whether our result is useful or not, because you know, we, yes, we say that we can extract the correlations, so, you know, amount which is order inverse Hilbert space dimension. Mm -hmm. And is it, is it useful? Like I, I probably I would say no, you know, that colloquially internally we say this is a garbage regime, you know, you get the correlations, but you know, it's just, just zero correlation in practice, right? So, so yes, that's right. So, I mean, so in some sense, there is a fine tuning required and then we need to actually put in the values to get the you know, results that within a reasonable scaling regime at the same time makes sense and not in the garbage regime, yeah. Okay. Great, thanks. Uh, so Sergio, you've been very patient. So can you, uh, do you want to, to deal? Mean, sure, yeah. Uh, so yeah, of course, I you know I think all these um, approaches are very interesting. And to the question if uh, XCB is a good measure in an adversarial setting or linear XCB, I agree it is not a good measure, especially if you don't have large depth. I you know I agree with with that. Uh, nevertheless, the way I see random circuit sampling, which you know doesn't have to be the way everybody sees it, but you know, the way I see it is <laughs> it's, it's a sampling problem, right? So then the, the problem itself is to sample from a distribution uh, with good fidelity. That's the way I think about it. So then of course the problem is what does it mean to be, you know, to have good fidelity? Um, and it's complicated, uh, but, but we have these uh, XCB measures which are estimators of fidelity. And linear XCB is one of them. We also have logarithmic XCB, for instance. And then we make sure in, in our experiment that we check that linear XCB and logarithmic XCB match within a statistical error, which doesn't happen for low enough depth, actually. Uh, in our experiment, we had enough depth that, that it works. So what that means, and, and you can do other things. You need to check that you have enough entropy, which there are ways to check that as well. Uh, meaning, you know, you're not just producing one bit of string all the time or, or, or a lot of bit of strings with low statistical distance. So I think, you know, eventually when you have large enough fidelity and you can run circuits with large enough depth, all these things that doesn't probably matter anymore because just getting 
any bias on the probability becomes exponentially hard in depth. Uh, but in the regime where we are now, where, you know, fortunately we have fairly noise, noisy gates and we can go only to certain depth, then I think all these other tests are as important. So in, in particular, you know, checking that you have good linear depth and, and, and sorry, uh, that the logarithmic XCV and the linear XCV coincide. And I think in the, in the method that they used in, in this paper, uh, if you check the logarithmic XCV, it will not coincide with the linear XCV. Mm -hmm. I see. So, so sorry. Are, are you are you are you suggesting that um, that uh, linear XCB for you know can be used as a proxy for logarithmic XCB, which is which is really what you wanted to do? No. And, uh, no. Sorry. No. What we really want is good fidelity. Sure. Sure. And you know when things go well. Uh, linear XCV is a good proxy of fidelity. And actually one thing that is nice about this paper, it gives more clarity mm. to what it means things go well, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, like you can actually, we have a better understanding now of, you know, roughly speaking is related to being in the port of Thomas regimes and whatnot, but some of the techniques in this paper, uh, the popular population dynamics techniques actually allows you to which some people in our group, Igor and Kosti, were looking into as well, allows mm -hmm. you to quantify a bit better what it means to be in the port of Thomas regime and, and allows you to say with more precision when you can try, you know, when, when you can trust uh, linear XCV as a, as a proxy of fidelity. Uh, but the, again, the point here for me is to sample with good fidelity. Linear XCV is an estimator of fidelity when things go well and they can go wrong. Logarithmic XCV is another estimator of fidelity, you, and, and, and there are more, uh, infinitely more actually. But anyway, just as a, for us, it, it looks like logarithmic XCV and linear XCV are both good measures, and then we check that they both coincide. Mm -hmm. right? So when you try to spoof the sampling, that's something, if, if you are interested in spoofing the sampling, which is not the approach that Boas is taking, I guess the approach that, that Boas is taking is let's just spoof you know, linear XCV. But if you take it as a sampling problem, which is my point of view, then you try to, you know, ideally you will try to uh, make sure that you pass all the possible tests for sampling correctly, or at least all the ones that have, you know, good sample efficiency. And in particular, checking that linear XCV and logarithmic XCV coincide. So, so, so I you, think maybe you conjecture that uh, maybe um, logarithmic XCB is harder to spoof than linear XCB? It's harder to spoof for this particular method, yes. I, where we for example, uh, if you were to go back to Boaz and Sun Wan, would you, would you say that your techniques may, would, would you know, is, is, it, is it clear to you when you look at your techniques that um, they are really tailored to linear XCB and would, would they? I mean, our current techniques they, definitely tailored, but I, I would just say, I think the way I would phrase uh, Sergio's uh, claim uh, or uh, uh, view is the following. So I uh, I said, I kind of define the problem with respect to a benchmark. And I said the benchmark should be statistically efficient. And uh, Sergio is basically saying, let's not have this restriction or uh, let's, let's look at the true probability distances, like for the probability distances like normal human beings look at. And, uh, and almost any probability distance measure, so whether it's fidelity, which I think in the context of classical thing would be the Batichara constant or a total variation, okay, divergence, all of those type of probability distances are going to be uh, to require exponential number of samples, but maybe that's okay. We still can do the same type of approach, which basically we can look at small uh, cases, uh, get uh, get evidence that uh, certain proxies are a good benchmark for this, and then uh, and, and and then and then extend. So uh, so so I think basically the 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 the, the main uh, I guess problem with, uh, maybe the main problem in some sense with the, uh, with using a, a, a distance measure that, uh, that you cannot use a, a polynomial number of samples to check is that say, uh, you know, if it makes it a little bit harder in some sense, uh, yeah, potentially like a, a classical algorithm, like for example, you, you know, uh, I, I cannot build in my basement, like say, say Google came up and came up with a black box. 
and uh, and, and, and now uh, I cannot build in my basement and say here is a box and it also samples from the same probability distribution because uh, because you need like two to the fifty samples from this probability distribution to evaluate something like uh, fidelity. Uh, so. Which maybe it's fine. Like I mean, this is also a view. Maybe I unreasonably restricted to a, a polynomial number of sample to sample efficiency, and uh, we can look at um, at benchmarks that don't require by a sample efficiency. But uh, I think we should be clear that that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, sorry, uh, yeah, no, that's that's very interesting. But going back to what what Sergio said, uh, doesn't doesn't it create a give you a very interesting open question, you know, so suppose you wanted to, suppose somebody came to you and said, look, can you now recreate your results for, for log XEB? Because, you know, in some sense, the regime that uh, Google was using was one where linear and, and uh, log XEB coincided, but, but maybe, you know, we can sort of say, well, maybe that was the, that was, you know, that was the original uh, uh, measure they had in mind, log XEB for a very long time. And then, Eventually, at the last minute, you know, they sort of said, "Well, it actually works also with linear XCB, and that's the, you know, that's where the Aronson gun conjecture was." was no, but I think there is, there. there is something very different. Okay, so log XCB is basically a KL divergence, right? This is uh, what we're talking yeah. about. So KL divergence, uh, you, you think about it like suppose you have, uh, you know, the uniform distribution. Mm. And you have a, a pseudo random distribution that has a far, far, far smaller support, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very, very different in KL distance. Mm -hmm. So so this is basically it shows that you cannot evaluate it using a polynomial number of samples. You, uh, the, the, uh, you basically, uh, and, and so pseudo random might not have been even the right thing. Like say, think, think an actual random with, a, but over to, say two to the square root and entries. So it's very dis different in KL but uh, it would take you more than a, a polynomial number of samples to, to know the difference. Mm -hmm. So basically this log divergence is not a metric that is statistically efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I don't know, I haven't thought about it, but I would just say that the, the, like, the, this is just a different ball game. Like it's a different type of benchmark and you should be kind of clear uh, if, if that's the, the benchmark, because I, th I think it's, it's worthwhile to try to think about what, what is precisely the benchmark that we set forward and what are the properties of this benchmark? So it's one thing to give up on computational efficiency. Mm. I think it's, an, it's another thing to even give up on sample efficiency. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's meaningless. It's still meaningful and still interesting, but it's, we should be aware that we are doing it. And I think if the difference between linear and log, that's the difference. Logarithmic XCV is sample efficient, right? The, I mean, what? Yeah. Logarithmic XCV is, it is sample efficient. Yeah. Okay, so what? It's a KL divergence, but you don't evaluate the term that corresponds to entropy of the sampling that you're performing. So you only first a cross term, not the second term. Therefore, you do not have to estimate the entropy of the sampling distribution. And that's why I'm saying you have to, you know, both check these estimators of fidelity, and then you need to have an, an additional check of entropy. Because yeah, the, but yeah, but, right. but I would like to add to what like Boaz is saying in the, in the following way. I mean, no matter whether it's a linear version of XAB or the logarithmic version of XAB, at the end of the day, the whole idea is we compare the correlations between the sampling distribution we have and the original probability distributions. Yeah. Right? So that, that's the idea. But we need to ask ourselves whether that's enough to certify the sampling task. Because, for example, as you know, as you know, some of us know. Suppose we sample one particular B strings again and again, and then this particular B strings is associated with the you know, heavy output. Like uh, the probability to obtain that B string is above average, for example. But of course, we don't we know it, we are not doing the sampling, right? right? However, if you evaluate, if you consider the correlations between the sampling distributions and the original distribution, it is not it is correlated in a non-trivial way, right? So you need That's to, right. to check correlations. And, and in that sense, logarithmic XCV tends to behave better than linear XCV because linear XCV is sort of very sensitive to very high probability with the strings. Logarithmic XCV is sort of smoother. And you need to estimate entropy, uh, which you can do 
I mean, there are probably other ways to do it, but one way we know how to do is to make sure that you don't have many beta strings, which are too close in Hamming distance to each other. And you can do this efficiently for not very large Hamming distance. I mean, yeah. But, but Boaz is saying the second part, you know, showing that the distribution has its own entropy very large is actually fundamentally difficult because we want to verify that the entropy associated with it is scaling with the, you know, the number of qubits. Mm -hmm. um, and that inevitably actually, you know, forces us to sample, uh, number of samples scales exponentially with the number of qubits. So that's, that's why, you know, that statistics will be statistically not as efficient. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's also like the case that uh, uh, also in cryptography, we kind of, once you start going into this cat and mouse uh, type of thing where you fix the benchmark, et cetera, it seems like it could be never ending. So in some sense, maybe you would say, if we don't have a clean, statistically efficient benchmark, maybe we do, maybe we don't. And we just simply say right now, the benchmark is not statistically efficient. And right now we are okay with that. And maybe that's okay also. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so the scientific claim is that uh, this is a device which uh, samples from a certain probability distribution and uh, no classical device of similar, uh, of, of uh, anything related to it in resources could sample from a probability distribution that is uh, close to it in say total variation or, uh, or yeah, that's, that's a fine scientific claim. We just need to be clear that this is the claim we are making. Yeah, I, I have a question then, Aiko. I think in our paper, we tried to be clear about that, if you actually read it, <laughs> that, you know, we're talking about a sampling problem. And I agree with you, then the problem is, you know, how do you check it? And, and there right. is no way to check it. So then we propose, you know, several methods. Uh, we propose these uh, estimators of fidelity. We check that they coincide. And then in addition, you have to, you know, make sure that you have good entropy, uh, which we know how to do up to certain but by looking for not too many collisions in coming distance, and it works up to certain coming distance. Although I, I think it was like exponential in the coming distance, so that won't scale forever, I guess. Yeah. And I wonder. I I, I will actually. I have a question for all of you. So suppose we give up about you know statistical efficiency. In other words, in order to show that our device is doing the right thing, you know, I need to sample exponentially many times. And that, of course, physically takes exponentially long time. And can we? Does it actually constitute, you know, quantum advantage in a sense that while we are sampling, maybe we do the brute force calculations for a very long time, such a way that by the time we are done with the you know, exponential many samplings, we obtain the probability distributions from the classical computation using exponentially large amount of resources. And now sampling is immediate because we have all like probability distribution, like full probability distribution. So I, I think we, we cannot just say we ditch out statistical efficiency because then that actually changes the complexity from the quantum side. So maybe like we need to actually keep one of them um, so that we can, we can keep the separation between quantum and classical. Actually, it meant to be a question. So what, what do you, why do you think about this? Yeah. I, mean, I, I think I agree with you and that's why we propose you know, these two things, right? Like estimators of fidelity, linear and logarithmic in particular, and making sure that they coincide. And in addition, um, you know, you need to check the entropy somehow. And, you know, it is an open problem. Uh, if that's good enough, maybe it's not. Uh, but, but, you know, but I agree with you that it's important to actually propose some, you know, sample efficient method. Ideally computational efficient too, but, we don't know how to do that, so we give up on that. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, um, thank you. This was a fantastic discussion. Um, th let's see. Um, uh, we are we are running. Uh, it's it's towards the end of our time, but um, maybe maybe we can take uh, just a few minutes for both um, any comments from from any of the uh, any of the audience, as, as well as um, maybe a, you know if there's a last comment anybody wants to give on the panel. Uh, you haven't heard a lot from Bill. I don't know if you have more to say. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm happy to say a lot of things. I I think uh, I, I think for so I I completely agree with everyone. I think it's really important that we have uh, statistical efficiency. I think you know number of uh, number of samples is uh, is is efficient. I think you know it would be better if we also had computational efficiency. Uh, but I guess I, I I want to be clear that it sounds like um, what Sergio is saying is not necessarily that we need uh, you know to to look at new uh, you know tests that are not sample efficient, but rather that we need to look at a whole bunch of tests. It would be better if they were all sample efficient we need to sort of consider all of these you know including the original sort of logarithmic cross entropy uh and the linear cross entropy and then see if we can we can sort of use those as a proxy for uh you know for for fidelity and it sounds like he would be more happy if if, if all of these uh were, were sample efficient um is that is that is that right uh sergio sorry oh, i don't you think have, we can you hear you Yes, and you need to check for entropy in addition, and you know. Uh, uh, and, and unfortunately, that's maybe not so uh, not so simple. Uh, we have a, a a method to check for at least not you don't have high collisions in Hamming distance, and mm -hmm. unfortunately, uh, we haven't published that yet actually. <laughs> but yeah, um, there is a there is you know that's that's something you can do checking that you don't have too many high collisions in Hamming distance so that. You know, the, the beta strings are, uh, you count like how many beta strings you have, how many distance five for any beta strings, or how many distance three, or how many distance seven. And, you know, you compare with what you will expect, and you see that you don't have too many, you know, that, that beta strings are not clustered in a, a small Hamming distance, which is, I think, exponential in the Hamming distance, but for these kind of experiments, at least we can do. It will break down eventually. I'll have to go back and see the details again. But let me suggest one more thing, actually, which is that you know a lot of the uh, the reason for these these sort of um, uh, you know these unfortunate results about how these tests are not sample efficient comes from uh, this sort of very stringent uh, you know setting that we're in, in which we're really we really don't want to be trusting the black box at all, right? Uh, you know, and that's where we start to get these lower bounds on uh, query on, on query complexity for testing, uh, you know. You know, total variation distance and so on. And, and of course, we don't, you know, if, if, my attitude is that quantum supremacy is already a pretty paranoid goal. So we certainly don't want to make, you know, too many assumptions or else we may as well just assume, you know, this, this, uh, that the quantum mechanics works and get on with our life. But, but I'm wondering, uh, especially from Sergio, whether there's some sort of in-between where maybe by making a little bit more assumption about the noise, uh, you know, that it's not totally adversarial, if that could sort of help us um, with this sample efficiency, uh, you know, um, you know, sort of increase the sample efficiency of some of these tests. Uh, it's already on Boas and, and Sunbon paper that you know, if you assume the noise is independent in every gate, that's one of the nice results in their paper. Then things, uh, are good. yeah, <laughs> what they explain. So, so the answer is actually yes. There are some some settings, but maybe we're not quite happy with with these sorts of. Uh, that that strong of an assumption. I mean, a classical algorithm doesn't need to obey, you know, this particular constraint, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, so actually, uh, on a on a related note, uh, I, I guess I it isn't it worth discussing, or at least bringing up this issue that um, uh, XEB can be used, uh, you know, as being used for benchmarking, and so, um, you know, yeah, so, just so maybe maybe it's worth you know sort of correlating that with that subject of the what 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 you said very very briefly is it? yeah sorry it's so no. yeah so like that's a very good point that's what i wanted to emphasize here um so we use a term benchmark but i realize that it's being used in a different way among physicists or scientists versus a computer scientist um and in the physics side we are just checking whether device is working in a way that we expect it to work and then we put the reasonable assumptions that's believable. But from quantum supremacy purposes or quantum advantage purposes, we, we need to be adversarial. You know, we, we need to put the bound, we need to you know, consider all possible spring method, and then we have a benchmarking for a certain task, but not the benchmarking for a quantum device. And then by working on this XCB, this sharp distinction between these two roles is something that I realized. So I fully trust like a rules experiment, and then you know it's, it's, it's remarkable, right? And I, 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 it's very believable that errors will be maybe maybe local and maybe like uncorrelated and very weak. So I actually trust that. I mean, I, and also our anal analysis indicates that. 
the fidelity they have achieved is actually very close to what they have already claimed. The problem is like quantum advantage task is like asking about a different aspect, you know, like is this task, the benchmark for the task against all the spoofing algorithm, you know, can be certified by XDB. So, so this adversarial setting is what we are, we are talking about. And I would like to make two comments. One is the first aspect is benchmarking quantum divide is a brilliant idea. And indeed, actually my colleague and I have worked on how to generalize this approach so they work for the analog quantum simulators, more broad classes that's not running random energy circuit. The second comment is the like adversarial setting. I'm not sure whether we have to delegate, you know, we have to force, for example, Google to come up with the better benchmark. Like in some sense, this is this should be, I think, a community effort. You know, Google already, you know, make all the measurement data and the samples and the choice of gauge, like you know, very transparent and publicly available. And then maybe we should, as a community, develop a new computational benchmark um, by ourselves and then try whether the Google sample uh, you know, it passes this test or not. So like, I wanted to emphasize that we shouldn't actually try to like, move into the situation where you, know, okay, you should try to prove that you have done the good job. But maybe as a community, we should come up with a better benchmark and then you know, help like Google certifying their sampling task. Great. Um, um, maybe shall we let that be the last word? And uh, thank you all. Thanks, Boaz, for a uh, great talk. And thank you to all the panelists. And um, see you all next week. Uh, Garnet Chan is going to talk about the possibility of quantum advantage in quantum chemistries. See you then. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.